From 1970 to 1995, producer P.J. O'Connell chronicled the diverse lives and stories of rural Pennsylvania. Immersing himself in the world of his subjects, P.J. tirelessly documented the extraordinary complexity of ordinary lives. Now, from the archives of Penn State Public Broadcasting, we present the video on demand exclusive series, P.J. O'Connell's Pennsylvania Parade. For the Pennsylvania Parade, I'm P.J. O'Connell. It has been a great privilege as producers of documentaries for Penn State Public Broadcasting to involve ourselves in the lives and actions of some very interesting and important people in rural Pennsylvania. This segment of the Pennsylvania Parade brought us very close to the central issues in one person's life. We met this person at a moment of crisis he describes himself as distressed and dispirited. He was dealing with issues of conflict, fear, anguish, and change. And we were allowed to observe and record his struggle. Charlie Mason is from an urban suburban background, moved by his superiors to a city of less than 10,000 in mountainous, isolated, backward, his term, rural Pennsylvania, and he is expected to lead the community, or at least his part of it. Charlie Mason's field is religion, and he's a professional, a minister, and his struggle is with what sort of professional he will be, whether the presumption that he will be the leader of his church is one that he can fulfill. Reverend Mason is expected to be a man with answers. In truth, he has a great many questions. Charlie Mason, and I have a little boy, Samuel, who's one, my wife is Lynn, and this is Ellen. And we've been married for eight years and been here in Lock Haven for a year and a half, haven't we, Ellen? Used to live in Salisbury, Maryland, where I had a parish for 10 years. I grew up in Springfield, Ohio, where uh, I was a Methodist, but uh, came to the Episcopal Church. When I was in college, at Oberlin College, my senior year I was confirmed, and I taught school for a year and then went to seminary. The um, church I serve is St. Paul's Church here in Lock Haven, a congregation of 160 members. It's about 100 years old, and uh, I guess like most parishes, it's had its ups and downs. Dorothy, remember to be like that. The dust which shall return you. Richard, remember to be like that. The dust which shall return you. For the first year, it was tough. Tough, tough. 
tough. I suppose it's just tough for churches and pastors to get used to each other for a while. It takes a while for the marriage to take, if you will. And people have to get used to each other, have to trust each other, have to discover each other's uh, style and uh, strong points and sore points and all the rest. Uh, St. Paul's Church and I are no exception. Being on the main street of downtown, you're really sort of an, an integral part of the life of the community. It's a, it's a county seat, a small town, a little bit stuck off in the mountains, and is not eager to identify with the rest of the world altogether. Yes, please. Have you been? Yeah. Very good. Very good, thank you. I guess I find the the town, um, well, <sighs> backward is the word that comes to my mind, but I don't mean that in such a negative way. I just mean that they aren't where the rest of the nation is, as I have experienced it, and some of that's good and some of that's bad. But that has created special problems for me because ministry is a fairly sensitive thing, and uh, you get used to... Uh, talking and uh, relating to people who are living uh, in touch with certain cultural uh, realities throughout our country. And uh, they aren't the same realities here as they were in my last parish. And, and that was a shock for me. That was, it's been a real change. And I think it's maybe been a, so a shock for some of the people in the parish. <laughs> uh, and I suppose some of that shock is very good and some of it's difficult to live with on both sides. Public worship is an integral part of Christian church's life because religion is not just a private thing it's a shared thing it has to do with worship and service and praise and uh, request it has to do with celebrating something a parade is the celebration of something in the past a victory won an accomplishment finished an ordeal undergone. All the issues are resolved in a parade. The war is over. The sides have settled their dispute. The anxiety has quieted. And there isn't any more risk in a parade. To preach regularly no is is to engage in a serious no discipline. To stand up Sunday by Sunday and make sense out of religious truth in such a way as to engage people's lives to not be stupid or boring and have it be worthwhile is a, is a, is a serious task. I came to St. Paul's Church uh, 20 months ago, there was some question as to whether the doors of this church would stay open. And that has been an issue in the life of this parish over the past uh, decade. I think I was here for probably a little over a year before I realized that this, this parish really was going to go financially. And people have been very generous we don't really have financial problems. Uh, we're in the midst of a capital funds drive right now for $9,000, and we're going to make it handily. Sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine that we receive. It's hard to be up and rejoice if, uh, if there are a lot of empty seats. That's the negative psychological. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
But I, I trust we can get over that one. I don't think that's insurmountable. I, on my good days, I don't. On my bad days, I do, I guess. Hi, Peggy. How are you? Good. Steve, good morning to you. Calvin? Super turn. Think that was good? Fantastic. I, like I got that into that one. Marching and, uh, that's boy. marching and parading. Wow. That's true, isn't that's it? That's something, yeah. Heavy. Something. Heavy stuff. You, you're well? Huh? Very well. And all that job oh, and yeah. all that business? Oh, yeah. Good. Fine. This is Fox. Pleasure to see you this morning. Welcome. Hope to see you again. You and I have still got to have an appointment. We do. We will. Stella. Sorry, I've been fast. Running so upset. You are so pure. No, I'm not. <laughs> My mother You are so pure. <laughs> have a nice trip. Thank you. Uh, yeah, have a nice trip. trip. Yeah, right. Okay. Richard, yeah, I hope your wife is... Uh, Recovers. Yes. Tell you something. P. I'm going out more, much richer than I came in. Well. I really enjoyed that day. Well. Good for you. Good Thank man, you. man, too, man. Thank you. Hey, you have a good trip. Okay. 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 Doctor, good morning yeah. to you. Very nice, sir. Thank you. Being a clergyman is a very political job. Good morning, Wes. How is that daddy of yours? That is to say, public opinion weighs heavily as to what will fly and what won't as to how things are going. And so one of the things that a clergyman is doing is he's always listening to where where people are and what they like and what they don't like and what they care about and what they don't care about. What strikes a responsive chord? You know, who's sick? Uh, what's the talk of the town? Because it's only in relation to all of that that he can really ply his trade and do any good. One of the difficulties with doing religion is you don't, it's very hard to evaluate. And uh, I'm always in the process of that. And, uh, and when people tell me they like it, well, I love it. <laughs> it helps, you know, it encourages me to uh, persevere in, in what is for me a difficult task. And that's leading a, leading a church. Preaching regularly is tough. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. I read something from Bruce Larson about the fact that we have to do the unbinding. Jesus gives life, but we have to do the unbinding. Very interesting. Study three. Oh, my. Sermon prep group is where I go to church. Sermon prep group is nice. Now look, I know people in the congregation who feel that we're dead and that there isn't any, you know, that we really don't count for much. Hmm. You know, we know services that are like that. We know exchanges that we have with people in the church that yeah. just drive us up the wall, you know. It, you know, it's, it's a couple of hours a week where we sort through our ministries together. Yeah, I really, I really leaned on that hard. I know that some of my Other preachers have been surprised to discover that I tape hard. my sermons every week and that I go, some of them know that I go every week uh, and work on it, and they have expressed surprise. I, I, just, I guess the death that I respond to in uh, churches is a church where nobody expects anything to happen, where we just, you know, you know, people come to church, you know, they want to keep the church open, they don't want to see the church go away. But they don't, but I, I have the sense that they don't really expect anything of any significance to ever come of it. Uh, and maybe that's, you know, maybe they've learned that from a long history of nothing happening. Uh, you know, I don't want to just blame them. Let's aim at that, because that's the way everybody feels. Mm -hmm. That's why nobody, that's why the vestry does, can think of all the things wrong. Well, you got me started on this thing, because I really, you know, I, I really, had some similar experiences of, you know, about church that just doesn't, you know, just wants to survive, you know, no yeah. expectations, yeah. other than possibly, you know, not no, no, no. closing the doors. Yeah. 
we are able to give perspective to each other as well as encouragement and hope and uh, help and sometimes love. Take some leadership about those dreams where before I just sort of immobilized. Like it can't be a lonely business. And, uh, it's very nice to have that. I think one of the things the servant has to do is to honor the horrible yeah. feeling mm -hmm. of death that people had in their own personal Get lives, in right. their families, their marriages that are screwed up, their kids that are that's freaking right. out, their church that's a pain in the tail half the time. You know, it, all of that's true. And it isn't God's business to tell you that ain't so, but what his business is is to say, you know, he comes to us and goes through all that with us, but he comes out on the other side. It's a tough job to preach. And anybody who gets into Christianity deep enough to have his life involved uh, on a regular, daily, you know, whatever it be, serious, seriously engaged with himself and with other people and with God somehow, will know how difficult the Christian life is. That's all there is to it. <laughs> I understand it's been a tough week. That's true. That's, that's a tough thing, isn't it, just being helpless? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't mean to pretend that I'm the answer man, but sometimes it's helpful to talk that sort of thing over with somebody. And well, the subject of meaning and value and purpose and what's going on in this world is raised most significantly and starkly when something wrong happens. And that's often, interestingly enough, that's often at variance with what so many people think. Because so many people think that religion has to do with things that are nice and pleasant and smooth and good and wholesome and happy. And that's true, but we don't usually realize it until, uh, until it gets tested. We may know the goodness of God and the goodness of this life and the beauty and, and the goodness of the things we experience, but we only know the truth and reality of it all when it gets tested in the fires. It isn't right that it isn't right. It isn't right. And I, and I, I just hate the idea of being as old as I am and still having that disagreeable feeling that isn't right. I know it, but I can't help it. I just can't help it. There's nothing I can do about it. So one day we went to see uh, Mary in the uh, Susquehanna Nursing Home. She was, I guess, 89 years old. She's a maiden lady who has lived here all her life, a lifelong and faithful member of this congregation. She is there against her will, and she resents it. Taking care of a lot of bunk. And you know darn well, and I mean more than that, that I could have my own home and take care of myself. What would you have done now with all the snow? I said, well, you poor darn fool. I said, do you think I would have gone to live from hand to mouth and have just two pieces of bread in a house? I said, I didn't. And I find it exhausting to be part of, uh, to deal with people at that level of intimacy and intensity. I said, I didn't live like that. It, it, is, it also is it. very humbling to realize uh, you really don't have all the answers. It's not, it, it, it keeps me from, uh, from, from having a lot of neat little pat answers because what, what you do when you, when somebody, when you touch somebody, yesterday I spent some time with a person and just, uh, who was dissatisfied with his life and, uh, and just before I went, I, I suggested uh, uh, an interpretation of this person's dissatisfaction, and this person began to cry uncontrollably. And uh, there's really nothing to do at that point. There is really not much to say. Really what one does is one stands, 
One holds the other person's hands and, uh, and sort of gazes at the mystery. And, uh, and we need that when things are very good, and we need that when things are very bad. And I guess we need that uh, by faith in all the humdrum days, too. Um, it's, uh, that's a lot of Christian ministry right there, I think. Mr. Kirkman uh, had a heart attack. They took him to the hospital, and the hospital called me a couple of times. They didn't think, they were afraid that he might not live until 9 o'clock, so I went up there early, and that's when I saw him. Well, he loves you. Yes, he does. He's a good man. The nurse said your priest is doing more for him than we could do. Is that right? He said he's, he's a little better. I love you. Well, I love you. I'm sorry I had to call That's you. That's all right. That's too much. I called worry. Lynn and I said, let it go till nine, unless otherwise yeah. the nurse said, yeah. you had better get him. Well, she said I could stay around and go see him every once in a while. I think I'd like to do that. Okay. Let's sit in a little bit. Okay. Or do you want to take a walk? Oh, that's a bad one. All right. <laughs> Did he talk to you? Did he ever? But he really is in pain. Yeah. And uh, he's really fighting. He's working hard right now. Mm -hmm. He's working hard. And I guess he's doing some of the most important work he'll ever do right now. You know, when it comes time to die, I don't know if he's dying. Mr. Kirkman did not uh, regain his health and get out of the hospital. On the other hand, Mrs. Kirkman has not been broken by that experience. And I wanted to say to her that, uh, that he wasn't losing a battle. If he was, in, in fact, in the process of dying, I didn't know whether he was or not. He was in intensive care, coronary care, I guess. But if he was, in, in fact, in the process of dying, Christians want to make that out as though that is a step toward God not a step away from life that they're not there isn't the battle is not to be won or lost it's it's a question of their their ability to offer the rest of their lives and even their pain and whatever struggles they have uh, to god himself and i think that's really what a person is doing when he is dying if she can understand that then it will be it can be a glorious thing of course, they will be separated, and that will be a painful thing. But to think of the final preparation and self-offering of oneself to God uh, is indeed important work. I want to welcome you, good people especially, to this, the highest feast of the Christian year. Today is the day of days because it is the celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Whatever else Christians believe, whatever they may disagree about, the central truth for all is that Jesus rose from the grave, that our ancient enemy and foe, death, has been conquered. And we share in Christ's victory, and we too shall follow him into everlasting life, into the very presence of God himself. This is a very traditional parish. A number of people, when I came, a number of members of the congregation didn't know each other's names, which I found uh, almost incredible uh, for a town and a church as small as this is. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to um, welcome you to the rectory. And, um, well, just in case you don't know everybody, and to add a little spice to the evening, and since, and since 
we had it. And since Valentine's is coming, we decided that we would play a game. People needed to learn how to have more fun together. In any family, you've got to spend some time having fun together. And that was true very much amongst the leadership. And so, uh, for the second year running, my wife and I decided we would invite the, the vestry uh, to a party. Ken, let me see who you are. Oh, Ken, you're perfect, man. You're beautiful. There seemed to be a, 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 a lack of a tradition of... Uh, working on things together, sharing ideas, uh, hopes, goals, plans, dreams together, and that's why we wanted to do it. I have my notes, uh, Freddie Hilton, as uh, chairman of Liz. Write it down. Um, Elizabeth smith Gall for Christian Education. I know the first year that we were here I felt very, very isolated in that I was the only person who seemed to think the parish needed to expand its horizons to do things that Christians have always done, education, service, ministry, to have people be a part of all of that and not have it be a one-man show. I think he's out of place. He ought to be directing. He ought to be masterminding our, our five-year or ten-year property plan. I very much wanted people to think bigger than they were thinking. And uh, that's very scary. That's very risky because you can't know ahead of time how it's all going to fall out. And uh, that's the thin ice that they and I were treading on for her. Oh, about a year. I hope that uh, I hope that you'll all come. It's really going to be fun. We're going to have four good Sunday evenings of uh, well, we're going to try to get people to be uh, uh, more involved with each other here in the parish in a real way, and I think it's good. I hope you'll all come. Six o'clock Sunday evening. Thank you for the fellowship that we have together here in this parish. Thank you for the, gift, for the gift of your son and presence with us always, building us into a big family. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let the fish fry begin. <laughs> During Lent, we had uh, four Sunday evening uh, uh, programs, and I was concerned whether people would uh, rise to the occasion, would come to these, would would receive what I think I have to offer to them by way of religious leadership. Okay, George, tell us a little bit about yourself. <coughs> I don't know what, what to say. I've been in Lock Haven 16 years. came here from Magnolia, Arkansas. Before Magnolia, we lived in Marietta, Ohio. And before that, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And before that, in Washington, D.C. And before that, in Bayonne, New Jersey. We really, we had one child in each of the... And that's why you didn't move again? <laughs> yes, that would be a reason. We uh, lived, Bill and I lived in Columbus, and that's where we met. And then we got married while we were in Columbus, and we had David while we were in Columbus. We moved to Urbana, and we had Martha in Urbana, and I hope we're not following your footsteps. <laughs> Our purpose in the whole series, but especially in that first uh, session, was to help the individuals get to know each other more personally. That's a need in this congregation. And to help them see that they all fit as pieces into a puzzle without which the puzzle is not complete. Oh, come. I wanted to laugh at I think they want to be. So we uh, used that little exercise of making a puzzle together, and no one of the individuals had the whole uh, puzzle together. He needed a piece from somebody else, but he couldn't take it. He had, it had to be given to him, which uh, very much represents exactly how a parish community uh, works. Nice. 
It really is frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. Made you cross it. You couldn't do it by right. yourself. I think that's a good point. See, it, we're so used. To, I think as Americans, especially, we're so used to being self-sufficient and thinking that if we just put our mind to it, we can do it ourselves. We don't need every, anybody else, you know. Mm -hmm. My discovery for the evening is that St. Paul's Church actually fits. I've never assumed that before. Isn't that interesting? I have assumed that St. Paul's Church was uh, sort of a, a collection of, uh, <laughs> of odd pieces. Yeah. The assumption of our exercise this evening is that the church belongs together in some kind of integral way, isn't it? Isn't that, what, isn't that, isn't that the thing? And I have never assumed that before. I really never have. But so but often... they fit better in some families than they do in other families. So often yes, the they church... Do. So I also, they all have the same nature, then they don't see, do they? <laughs> that's been my problem with thinking about the church, that it was my task as the pastor to help you put your square together, and then I would spend a little time once we got your square together, and then I'd help you put your square together. See, but actually, your square and your square is really part is all, uh, of the same thing. And it's part of my square, square too. Yeah. See? See, because you think I did it. Yeah, really, really. <laughs> I mean, I mean, my helping you put your square together is helping me to put my square together. Right, right, if, if, right. if we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Right. And you're an integral part of my putting my square together, just like you're an integral part of her putting her square together. That's nice stuff. Hollywood squares and no Anglican squares. Anglican squares. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you could call it. Oh, bad news. Uh, the four Lenten series uh, Sunday evenings have been uh, done, and I want to tell you that uh, the highest attendance was 12, and the lowest attendance was 7. I was not here one of them uh, because I had the flu. Um, I'd like to say that I was, I was a little bit disappointed that there weren't more people. Uh, and I wonder if any of you have any feedback about the program or its publicity or its design. Do you remember Susie came two months ago uh, to present it? And um, uh, I'd be interested in any reflections that any of you have on what we attempted. I believe the question I was the most enjoyable, really, of all of them, that we had done the three that we attended. I'm sorry that more people did not attend. Do you have any sense of why more people didn't attend? That's what I'm really asking. Oh, us. no, uh, I don't. Unless it just was something new and different. And, well, you know me, how I think about it is where it comes from. <coughs> I mean, I, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit aware that I come in and bring all these hot shot new ideas and all this stuff. I know, you know, and I know that some of the people really don't turn on to that, and I really don't want to turn those people off, but this is my style. Okay, if we work at it, how can we make sure that my natural tendencies just don't overwhelm the people here? That's what we're doing. I, think we, I just wonder if we don't. to have your wife. Is this, a, is this really a problem? Is it really a problem? I don't think that uh, that most people in the church, I mean, you said, you know, you're some young guy that came in here with all these crazy ideas and so forth. You know, um, maybe people say, well, you know, he's a little wild. But really, I, I, don't, I don't see where this is, is really a, a okay. problem. Okay. I, I don't want this to happen, a, a split to happen. That's a bit preventative more than anything else. You know, when I come to this parish, after uh, they've been used to a, an entirely different uh, pastor for 20 years, I know that some of the things that I do does not meet the normal expectations of some of the members of this congregation. And uh, I know that when I say some things, it will cause some people anxiety. And... Um, this congregation and I are only beginning to become honest enough with each other 
to let there be that anxiety and even anger out in the middle of the room when we interact because we've always been afraid of that and we've always hidden it. Either they have hidden it within their hearts or I have hidden it within my heart. But that's not honest. Dear me, and it can never get solved there either. In conflict, one of the things we tend to do very rapidly is personalize the conflict, blame people. And part of the reality is that regardless of who the person is, in many situations, you can take anybody, put them in that situation, and they will be in conflict. The conflict management uh, seminar for me was very helpful just to be able to hear and spend a day considering the issues of conflict in my own life, particularly my professional life, because there's a fair amount of conflict if change is going on. The first step in exorcism, name the demon. First step in conflict is to name the beast. Uh, frequently, naming the demon is all you have to do. Frequently in conflict, naming the conflict is all you have to do. About half the time. Pay attention to the name your presenter attaches to the beast. Check to see if they are clear about what the problem is. Now that see seminar drew on the techniques of uh, the social sciences in, and, and a Christian led it and Christians uh, received it and participated in it as Christians and it did not diminish their faith it enhanced their performance within their faith and their ability to help people deal with the conflicts that we're involved in day and night all the time even with amongst ourselves didn't Jesus deal with conflicts dear heavens St. Paul was writing letters half of his letters are dealing with you know half of the content of his letters had to do with conflicts in the churches all, all there around the early church Churches always had conflicts. Whether people, there are going to be conflicts. This is part of what I was talking about at the annual meeting when I said, I, I think we need to learn how to, we've got to sharpen our aim as a congregation. And to do that, it seems to me the leadership group, the vestry, needs to work on how we do that together. What do you think of the idea? I've got somebody in mind who has done this, Father Allen, in the Wingsport. The vestry, the leadership of this parish that I had inherited was, was not one that was used to taking initiative and responsibility in, le in leadership. And there's a growing use of a technique of a, of a conference in church today to deal with specific issues. If we're going to be a leadership group, we will have to learn to work together as a group. Um, and part of what I think uh, Roger will do is to spend some time helping individuals figure out where they are and where they are in relationship to the church and where they are in relationship to the leadership of the church. And those are fairly involved things. Now, you don't do that just, you know, uh, but, but unless we're talking at that level, I guess he feels uh, that uh, leadership will be whoever's the strongest person on the vestry, or it will be all me, and when you guys say yes, or... In I that sense, I really have been an innovator here, and I know that's been very hard for some people, because, gee, if you've never been involved in, in, in Christian leadership before, it's a shock to all of a sudden be responsible, or, or at least partly responsible for the spiritual direction of a congregation and lay people share that responsibility and I know that a number of people have been quite uneasy with that I think whatever we do is really good I think the reason they are willing to do it is because um, because they know I really want them to <coughs> and I think some of them see and I think many of them feel like they don't know what they're doing on the vestry. Okay? okay? They feel the need, although they don't know what they want. What do they think they want? Roger is a very 
capable person. He has done a number of vestry conferences. Beside this, I should say, I trust and I'm very fond of Roger. Do you want this conference to be a time when you are with your leaders dealing with the institutional and fabric problems of St. Paul's Church, or do you want it to be a time when you are dealing with the deepening of your, of your life in Christ as your people? We're not. The institutional stuff, I don't think... I think the reason the institution isn't healthier is because the, the, the whole spiritual stuff isn't healthier. I really think that's true. I do not think we have a common purpose, because their purpose is to, is to have a church. See, And my purpose is really to do something significant you know, in, lives of, in the lives of people, and I figure that's what we're doing together. But I don't really think we share that. We've never been able to really share that. I have, with a few, with a couple of the people, but they're very reticent, hesitant to talk about that own any of that as the vestry's responsibility. They see themselves as, you know, to make sure that the pipes are, are fixed. Do they know how much these kinds of questions bother you? About them, you mean? No, I don't think they do. Well, would, it be, would you perceive it as risky to let them know how much it, you know, that it seems obscene to you? To I tell sure you what I'll have trouble doing. I'll tell you honestly what I have trouble doing. I'll have trouble telling them that without judging the hell out of them. When I let that go in myself, you know, it'll come out like you. I'm afraid, that's what I'm afraid of. And that may blow the whole, I mean, you know, I can, I can work on it, <laughs> you know, and make sure that doesn't happen, but that's, that's going to be the risk for me. I feel that to be the risk. Because I really do judge them for that. I think I really do judge them for that. The subject matter for this sharing exercise is, uh, I've titled uh, Dreams and Nightmares that I have about the church. That begins to set the, uh, the perimeters of what the day is going to be like. Everybody's got dreams about what the best in life is, it can be, and what we hope for. And everybody's got nightmares about what the just an un impossible, intolerable situation First might be. Realize, you know, that uh, St. Paul's isn't just necessarily going to be for here forever. You know, that it, it could disappear. I guess, you know, all my life, I figure, well, you know, I'll always be a St. Paul's, why not, you know? Well, gee, uh, it is an automatic, you know? I became active in the church. I've seen the membership uh, drop, you know, mainly because the, uh, the older members of the church were becoming uh, ill, not able to attend regularly. Uh, some of them were passing away. Some of them were becoming uh, to the point where they were not able to get out on the Sunday because of lack of transportation and, and the mobility wasn't as good as it was. And, uh, there was no bottom growth. Youth. That's been my fear. Apathy? Would you? My deepest fear about the church. Part of it is a personal ina inadequacy you know, to uh, do what is required of the pastor. But another is that nobody will respond, and that it will eternally be up to me to generate whatever happens. Fear of lack of fulfillment of ourselves, uh, not being adequate to uh, church requirements and demands. We worry about the dwindling attendance. We're hoping for growing attendance. That's why I think that we didn't really have very many fears. We do fear regression, going backwards instead of forward. We don't see much, much chance of doing that because we're thinking positively. Father Mason started and said that his deepest fears were two, personal inadequacy, and the second one that 
that we won't respond, that we won't pick up the ministry and we won't share it with each other, that it's always his responsibility. If someone's sick, we call him instead of going ourselves. Someone needs to talk, we say, well, why don't you go talk to Father Mason instead of talking to the person ourselves. And uh, out of that very little exercise arose a, a serious sharing thing in the whole group. Uh, Carol Brown says to me, I'm not supposed to let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. How am I supposed to let you know that I do care about the, the people in, the, in this parish and the people who live next door to me, and I do think I'm doing exactly what you're talking about. Well, shut my mouth. <laughs> there I am. Uh, why? Part of what happened at that point, I think, is that, is that uh, uh, somebody said to me, yes, we're really in it with you, Charlie. And see, I'd never really had anybody in that parish say that to me before, and that's why, that, that's why I'm sure I reacted negatively or at that point or, or, or defensively, and that's why there was that long pause, because uh, somebody said yes, and then we had to decide what to do next. No, it wasn't a question, it was just a comment. But that's, but that's a real serious thing here with conference leaders. Don't, don't, don't stop it. Well, I, I, you know, I feel like I am right. Don't stop it. But if that's one of your fears, um, how do I help you take care of your fears? I'll tell you. Well, this is what I, I am more excited about today than I've been about anything in a long time, because just this kind of exchange can happen, Carol. Because, you know, because... For you to walk up to me on Sunday morning or for me to walk up to you on Thursday afternoon and say, hey, what have you done for God lately is so bizarre as to be, you know, and this allows us to talk about it, and I really appreciate you saying And I don't come to you and say, oh, somebody was sick and I went and talked to them for you. I mean, that's, and it goes on all the time. I think you can cross that fear off. Just know Carol, that you consider how you treat other people in this parish to be of prime importance in your life makes me feel like I've done my job today. You hear me? See, and I didn't know that, because you never told me. And we need to talk about that a little more, that's all. Because I just, see, see, I have to do all the preaching. That's one of the troubles. <laughs> and I don't know it all, do you see? <laughs> I hear a little bit about it here and there, but, uh, um, well, I appreciate your saying so. Oh, I had hoped that something valuable would happen, but I didn't really expect it to, to be with me. <laughs> I didn't expect it to be nearly such a personal experience or, or that I would be the one uh, called upon to be open and vulnerable. Um, I had hoped it would happen to them. <laughs> you see, I am just like everybody else. It was uh, significant. <laughs> that's a clever, that's nice, that's that's clever. clever. Very, very good. And at one point, uh, a girl said, uh, well, now, you know, one of the things in the Bible says, that my, I'm not supposed to let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. How am I supposed to tell you that I really do care about the people of this parish and the people, other people in my life, and I'm doing what I think you're talking about, if, um, if I'm supposed to be uh, quiet and, uh, and, and uh, private about that? And there was this long, <laughs> deep <laughs> silence, and I made some... I would crack some remark, stupid so remark, and Roger said, well, now, Charlie, you know, we maybe ought to listen to that a little. Let's dig out a little deeper. That's why we asked him to come. <laughs> Clever. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was just, well, and then it went on, and Roger was very good in terms of uh, red power and safety as opposed to you know, following Jesus with the uh, cross. Yeah. And then we started to do some planning. On, uh, we worked on a, a goal for the parish and worked on some uh, purpose, some goals and some strategies. And it was in the middle of that that I had to leave. 
So <laughs> that really kind of affirmation is nice to get yeah, laid on you every now and then. Mark it down. It's, it's better people than who get led. Yes, and it turns out, it turns out. Uh, but they're all closet better people. Well, not entirely. No, it's it's that uh, that I've been as as we were talking earlier this afternoon that I've been playing a combination of Ain't It Awful and uh, uh, Elijah alone amongst those who are. I only I. I only I, Lord. The only good guy you got left. Church is a lot of one-on-one Yeah, that's and great. <laughs> now I feel like I am on the edge of the unknown, having come through in a short period. Uh, you know, where every question and hopes that the parish, or half of him hopes it will be. But then when he gets there, the other half of him says, "Oh my God, where have we come? <laughs> what are we going to do now?" Now for my next step. Yes. Now for my next step. See, no, the, the point is that we aren't in the picture near as much as we no, used to be. No, we are yeah. not the center anymore. No. Much less so. In a way, I've got to trust these people in a way that I've never trusted them before. The church never. is where the action Which is starts, really scary it's not where it stops. I mean, the real, the way to evaluate the effectiveness of the church, you know, you have to get an aggregate of all kinds of good things that are going on quite apart from the church. The structures and its committees and everything else like that. It's what impact is it having in the world going on? Uh, in, in the community or in the area of society where it finds itself. You don't evaluate the church in terms of how well the church is. That's, that's churchy you know, you know, the church. It really does make a difference whether the church is a means or an end. That's and right. We talk, and we're very good at talking about the church being a, being a means, but we act like it's a end. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a super good time and very helpful. Um, I guess it should be noted a classic phrase that Roger could only come up with. Charlie, Roger is you ain't never going to get them back in the box again. <laughs> Wonderful. Doesn't <laughs> 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 been over though. Yeah. That's, uh... mm -hmm. Mm. Good business, best business going, PJ. Best thing in the world. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I cannot imagine doing anything else today. There are days when I could. But it, it, uh, it, it expresses and celebrates the whole of life in the best imaginable way. And I even get paid for it. <laughs> Let's go down Wednesday, what do you say? Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. Right now, there's an incredible amount of movement going on. I feel very, uh, very engaged. A year and a half, a year ago, a year and a half ago, it didn't feel like a whole lot of movement going on at all. And I felt, uh, oh, depressed and uh, dispirited, as though I weren't earning my keep, as though I weren't useful. Just takes. It thing, takes time for things to mature in God's good time. Uh, and one of the things that these people are teaching me is uh, more of a sense of stability and patience. They really are. That's something I need to learn. I got flash, but I don't have as much stability as they have. And uh, that's much needed in our world today. My dear. They can use a little flash, but I can use the stability. <laughs>
Charlie Mason is not everyone's cup of tea. Some may find him and this documentary record of his struggles to be disturbing or even offensive. But Mason is engaged in a very real and always timely struggle, the problems of leadership and change. His field is religion, but the issues of uncertainty and conflict are familiar to anyone with leadership responsibilities. And this documentary allows us an insider's look into the process of leadership development, an often particularly difficult task in the religious arena. As Charlie Mason works his way toward the discovery that leadership can and perhaps must be shared, we can observe and learn. It is a rare opportunity. Charlie Mason left Lock Haven, Pennsylvania for a larger city in the Midwest in 1984. He is still facing many of the same problems, church finances, personal and professional uncertainties. But if our conversations with him are an accurate measure, he continues to bring substantial energy and dedication to his profession and to his life. The documentary you've just seen has this important feature. It fixes one set of points in a vast flow of events and presents them slowly and in detail so that the development of Charlie Mason's story is understandable and as compelling as the producers originally found it. It was a rare opportunity and as a producer for Penn State Public Broadcasting, I was delighted to be a part of it. For the Pennsylvania Parade, I'm P.J. O'Connell.